please, please go ahead. And our next speaker, Katana Jones, is going to give us a talk about everyday humane education. Please welcome her back to the podium. Oh God, she's back. Hopefully you guys aren't getting too sick of me yet. All right, what is humane education? I'm sure all of us have heard of it. What it truly means is to nurture compassion and respect for living things. And that is all living things. It's not just our pets or even wildlife, it's plants. The ecosystem, the entire planet, everything that is alive on this earth. And it's the environment as well as the animals, as well as the plants. And it was uh, coined in 1868 by George Angel, who founded the MSPCA, which is the Massachusetts SPCA in the US. And this is a quote that we found in a really old education book that was, um, it was a, a book from the 1800s for teachers. It was a, a little manual handbook. And we found this in there. This was the first record that we could find of mentioning humane education. So this isn't something new. It's not something we came up with, you know, in our, our cleverness. This has been around for a really long time. And we saw the history previously. I think it was Bridget, right, that showed the history? Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's been around. It's not a brand new concept. So what's been going on in this humane movement? In ancient Egypt, they were revered as gods. Um, does that mean that they loved them and respected them for being cats or for being gods. I'm, I'm not sure, I'll leave that open to interpretation, but there is record of someone who ran over a cat with a chariot and he was stoned to death. So apparently they had, they really liked their cats, even more so than us crazy cat people. Um, they've been involved, er, um, part of the cruelty concerns in regarding um, the horse industry, that was the first situations where we were deciding that we needed to do something to help animals and horses being the ones that were the most used and utilized and often abused. Those laws turned up and became the first anti-cruelty bill that occurred in England. And then we started some animal protection activities in Europe and then into the US. In Australia, your first anti-cruelty law was in 1837. And then different territories started popping up they're different SPCAs. And then in 19, where is it? I lost it. 1980, I believe, all of the separate SPCAs agreed that they wanted to have one SPCA. And it was a, a, a unanimous agreement. So this has been progressing all over the world for a really, really long time, which shows we're just getting stronger and bigger and bigger. So can you imagine back then, the people like us that were seeing these things happen to horses? and the way pets were being treated, and we felt like there's, there's no hope. We can never help these horses. Look at in an entire lifetime, we can't make this happen. But look at where we are now as compared to 1837. We've really done quite a bit, and that's all thanks to you guys, that all the hard work that you're doing, even though I know it can be quite frustrating and difficult, but all of you are involved in moving this momentum forward. So, Surprise, you're already a humane educator. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, everyone in here is a humane educator. So let's maybe change that conversation. Instead of calling it education, let's maybe call it dialogue or conversation. So I don't wanna say education implying that people need to be told how to do things better. But let's look at it instead as an informative conversation where I could share some of the stuff I know and maybe make your life easier and maybe you could share some of the stuff that you know and we could develop something together. So instead of, I'm going to teach you how to take better care of your pet, it's let's have a conversation about great pet care and it can be perceived a little bit more positively. So every single interaction you have, pet owners or not, is a humane education moment. Every phone call, every email, every conversation you have in line at the store where you're wearing your shirt that says SPCA on the back, the people in line behind you are getting a message from you. Everything is a humane education message. So just keep that in mind, what type of messages that we're sharing. Hopefully they're, they're really good ones. Oh yeah, every single one. The most obvious is the stuff that we're literally saying to them. Am I willing to take the time to talk to you? 
So if I'm rushed, my example of when I rushed that poor woman out the door, who I'm sure hates me to this day, um, I was telling her her problem was not worth my time. Your pets are not worth my time and my attention because me sitting at this desk is more important than you and them. That was a really bad education. And that I educated her then, didn't I? Not in a very well, or a very good way. It was a bad educational moment. So what are we literally saying? Are, they, are we letting them know you're worth my time? I care about you. I care about your pet. Even if I disagree with you, I still care. Are we helping them or judging them? Talked about that previously. And then there's the other things. What are we unintentionally saying? And I think <laughs> a lot of us are very emotional and we tend to wear our hearts on our sleeves a lot and we get that look. I feel like it's the permanent rescue face, that look. W work on that in the mirror. <laughs> and it, what's our body language saying? Is it this? Yes, thank you for coming. Can we be open a little bit? You know, the closed body versus open body. Have your toes pointing toward them versus pointing away. There's all kinds of these human psychological communication tools that you can try to do. I don't know anything about that stuff. Somebody else can talk to you about that. But we never know who could be watching. We might be making a comment, and I've seen this happen, and the child is right there in the corner. You went into the bathroom and made a comment to your coworker, and their kid was in there, and they heard you saying something about their family. And maybe that question makes them kind of question themselves or their family. Are, are we a bad family? You don't know who's watching. You don't know who's listening. And that's kind of tying into what I was talking about earlier. Let's just stop saying that stuff and thinking that stuff so we don't have to have these, oh, crap, I didn't know she was standing right there. You know when you talk about your coworkers and they were right there too? It's happened to me before. So let's just not do it anymore so you don't get caught. Or you send that email and you about somebody and you accidentally cc them on it <laughs> oh i'm sorry that was meant for someone else clearly i was talking about you and how much of a jerk you are i've never done that what are you saying in other ways what do your posters look like what do your walls look like are they faded and the corners are all torn up and they're missing and they're scotch taped onto the walls and they're kind of peeling and maybe they're from 1984's humane week and they're kind of out of style. That means we're not current, we're not modern. It sets a tone. So get rid of that old nasty stuff and get some new stuff. Get nice, modern, current, bright information that's educational. And don't oversaturate. I know you guys have laws about um, posting things on polls. And I don't know if you have, um, in the areas where you don't have those regulations, if you have telephone poles that are made of staples, do you guys have those? Yeah, and you try to hang some. I had a yard sale recently. I couldn't hang a yard sale sign. I had a hammer and nails. I couldn't get through the staples into the pole. That's oversaturation. It's like going into a birthday card aisle and trying to pick out a birthday card. It's so many. And somebody mentioned earlier about you, there's just so many cats, you're overwhelmed and you can't choose. If your walls are papered with flyers and notices and posters and drawings and birthday cards, it starts to become overwhelming and that noise saturates. So choose your messages and display them appropriately so you can use those as an educational tour, um, tool. Same with your flyers and handouts. Have it be good stuff that's useful and not just, you know, I got these free from, I don't know, the local car washing company. Have it be relevant and useful and something that is a, a tool that they might want to take home with them. Same thing with the um, type of things that you're using with your own pets. They're watching how you're caring for the pets and that's setting an example for them. So what type of toys do your, the pets in your care have? What type of tools are you using? What type of cleaning products um, do you have on display that might be appropriate for them, like you know, removing cat urine, that type of stuff? And I want you to know your recommendations, and I'm gonna get to, into this a little bit more, but if you're recommending a trainer, say, or a groomer, or a veterinarian, or a clinic, do you know them personally? Because by you recommending them, you're vouching for their credentials. If you don't know who they are, they represent you. As soon as you give them that reference, that company, or that person, or that vet, or that trainer represents you. So make sure the references that you're giving are good quality references. 
What are their philosophies? Do you know someone there personally? Ask for so-and-so because he's the best or whatever the case may be. And do they align with what you believe? And are you having consistent messaging among your staff and volunteers? So if someone comes in and says, my dog is, he's not great with other dogs, but I don't know. I, I was thinking about maybe getting a cat for him. And this volunteer says, well, no, a dog that's not good with other dogs can't be with a cat. And then they walk down the hall and are looking at something else, you know, thinking ferrets. Well, it's, oh, yeah, d they run into another staff member. Yeah, dogs can totally be with cats. That's fine. You just have to have a shot call around them, and then they'll be okay. And then they walk down the hall and come into someone else, and they talk about dominance training. And then the next person talks about clicker training. And the next person, it, it can go on and on. So if everybody in the building is giving different information, you're not giving a consistent message. So I think it's a good idea to have a policy for what your message is regarding vet care, regarding behavior and training, husbandry, nutrition, and have everybody on the same page and have it be a policy. It's This is our professional organization's philosophy. Even if this isn't yours personally, when you represent us, this is the answer. And if you don't know, this is who you refer them to. Or this group of staff does not answer any questions about X, you refer them to so-and-so. So maybe you only have people ask medical questions of your medical staff, for, for example. And some, it, it's hard to do, I get that. I know it's hard to do, um, but having some consistency and perhaps accountability I think is a really good idea. And we had that problem um, at a place that I was consulting with where one of the trainer's uncle was a shot collar trainer and that was against our p philosophies at our organization. And he would go up to people after we had already spoken to them and give them information about this other trainer. And we warned him and we ended up letting him go because he was undermining our organization's philosophy. And I'm not saying fire your staff. I'm just saying keep track and make sure that they do truly represent you. Is your information current or is it outdated? This is something that I found, because you know, WikiHow is such a reliable source of information. It, this is current right now. How to alpha roll an aggressive dog, but it's specific to say you should splay your fingers so that you can pin them down better. And to be careful, because if your hand is near your, their muzzle, then you may get bit. <laughs> Thanks for that safety tip <laughs> on this horrendous piece of advice. So is it erroneous? Do you have stuff that's not currently um, supported by science and supported by research? So just make sure all of this stuff that you're sharing with people is, is up to date and good stuff. It reflects on you personally. It reflects on your organization in particular or in your community. And it reflects on our entire industry. If one of us is a group of crazy rescue people, if that's the only experience that a particular person has with rescue, then that represents all of us. So we all kind of have to be on a similar page as, as much as we can. So like I said earlier, that's my, I, that little stories part is supposed to be out there. That's my cue for me, <laughs> not for you guys. I should have deleted that. Um, we don't always get second chances. So my wow. example of that woman who I, I totally screwed up, our first impression may be it. And even if we had a bad day, oh crap, I shouldn't have said that. I'm not gonna get a second shot. So if you're having a bad day, maybe invite somebody else to take over for you because this person is really being a giant pain. Send them to the other person that's really good at talking people down. We had a guy that was an ex-cop. He'd been a cop for, I don't know, like 100 years. And he was really good at talking people down. He was in charge of the SWAT team also. So it was real good. And we just sent everybody to him. We didn't deal with anybody difficult. And he took me to some verbal judo classes. Have you ever heard of that? It's very cool. And um, uh, ways to use your conversation to get the information that you need and to talk somebody down and out of a, a volatile situation because rescue can be quite emotional for both sides. So everyday communication, we want it to be successful. This, again, they chose us. They could have had another option. I don't want to beat that point. Think about your words, your choice of what you're saying. Ensure consistent messaging. Have all of those handbooks that your employees receive, because everybody gets a handbook, because we all have standard operating procedures that we give out to our staff, and everybody has a job description, right? 
I know. I, a lot of rescues don't have them, but try to. Have that be your goal. They're out there. You can get um, SOPs that are uh, templates that you can use and start to create job descriptions and start building into that and having the description of your philosophies as part of that job description. And as new staff comes in, they sign off on that, and that's how you can help hold them accountable. What are your philosophies? Maybe you have to sit down with your team and figure out what they are. So I can't be mad at someone for recommending something if we don't have a standard formal philosophy. So how do you feel about these things? And it's whatever your organization decides. It's not for me to tell you. It's not for the person at the next table to tell you. It's what works for your group with the species that you're caring for in the community that you are working. So that may be different from group to group. Honesty is better than being wrong. I like to always tell people, just be okay with saying I don't know. You know what, that's a really good question. Can I take your number and get back to you on that? Because I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. Or, I have no idea, but here's the business card of somebody who might know that answer. So even not knowing is better than making it up or maybe giving information that you kind of think might be on the right track. Just say I don't know and get them to somebody that they do know or that um, does know and then you're still a useful resource. Know your recommendations. This is um, something that I, is <laughs> really important to me, especially my industry. Uh, it, that dog and cat behavior and training industry, there's this huge divide, as you know, different philosophies. And so this is something that I, I'm really rather a stickler about. If you're referring to people you need to know who they are, see them in action. So they might tell you that they do something, but then they actually do something differently. So ask them to come in and talk to the staff or give a demonstration or, hey, can I stop by and visit your grooming shop sometime? And you go in and see that they hit the dogs. Well, then <laughs> it's probably, thanks for your time. Bye. And let the, see if they're truly in line with who you want to be a reference for you. So this is my gratuitous book plug. This is a book that I created and it's designed for pet owners, veterinary um, clinics and shelters. And it's a way to find a good dog trainer. So it's got questions in there, how to interview a dog trainer, the red flags that tell you when this is probably not someone that you should be working with, what the credentials mean, what the certifications mean, all those alphabet soup that's after people's names what terms are actually regulated in our industry, what terms aren't regulated, all that nonsense is spelled out in a skinny, cheap little book. But in your bags, one of my sponsors, Dogwise, who's the publisher, gave you a free ebook download. So you can get a free copy of this and make it available to your clients. And by the way, any of the proceeds that I get, I donate. So it's not for me. I just want to help animals. Oops. Continuing Ed. Congratulations, you've all done that. Keep up to date, webinars, classes, having a speaker come and talk to you, having somebody who is not necessarily in rescue but knows about nutrition, knows about grooming, knows about, I don't know, what's latest and greatest in leashes, anything that's related to animals, get to know these people, have them invite them in to do a staff presentation or a little lunch and learn. Um, there's so many online education options that you can have just like this. And for the management staff, if you don't already know about SAWA, it's an um, organization for animal welfare um, administrators so that you can learn how to administer, how to run a shelter effectively. So it's for management and CEOs and executive directors and such. So formal programs, and I'm going to end early because I wanted to zip through some of this stuff that we're, er, that we'd already covered. You, the big thing is you don't need to know it all. If you want to do a formal humane education program in addition to the day-by-day -day stuff that you're already doing, you can't predict what other people know. I know now doing humane education programs and classes is very different than it was when I was a kid. These kids know the answers to everything because they're, you know, on their phones all day long. They're looking up the answer as you're <laughs> describing it and then they give you the answer immediately and then you look, you're embarrassed because you don't have anything to say. So kids today are really savvy. So that can be a, maybe a tough audience to start with, especially tweens and teens. They know everything, absolutely everything, whether it's wrong or right, they know. 
So whatever topic it's going to be, just research it really well. Make sure that you're comfortable with it and well-versed. And again, don't bluff or fabricate it because if they can look it up and say, well, actually, um, Miss Jones, it says right here that that's not true. Oh, well, <laughs> that sucks. So it, make sure that you know and aren't giving something that can, you know, come back and bite you in the butt. Um, again, get back to them with the right answer. And that's actually covered up a little bit, but it's TV and the internet have come um, contributed. The public is more informed than it once was. It's getting better, slowly, very slowly, but surely it's getting better. If you want to have a formal program, who's going to teach it? Is it going to be you? Great. She's got another brilliant idea that we're going to fit into all of our free time that we have. We're going to start a program and dog play and cat training and humane education and enrichment. Pick one, whatever you want. I'm okay with that. Just pick one. And who's going to do it? Is it going to be your staff? We use um, an organization that I worked with previously in a, a colleague would work with retired teachers. They were looking for something to do in their retirement, and they already know how to teach kids. Well, some of them. You, you guys have had some crappy teachers, right? You can remember them? Yeah, I had some too. But then I have some that I remember. Mr. Garoline, he was the best teacher I ever had. I still remember him. We started in third grade together, and he came to um, my master's program graduation. He was so important to me. He changed my personality and my life. There are those teachers out there, and some of them are retired. Scoop them up before somebody else gets them, before they start volunteering. I don't know, so somebody who does something with plants. You need them. Get them. Steal them. They want something to do. Or maybe it's a paid consultant. Maybe you hire somebody to do your programs. Or maybe you hire somebody to come in once a month or once a year. Or maybe you, have, you hire staff to do it. Um, some of the programs can pay for themselves if you charge for them but often humane education programs tend to be free or really low cost. So it, volunteer teachers doing it is usually the best because they already know what they're doing if they're a retired teacher. Free or fee. F free is very appealing, um, but you do have to consider no-shows. If you do a free, or, uh, free presentation or program and there's 80 people signed up and seven show up. So I do a, a pets and baby preparation class, and I charge $5 to come to the class. If you pay at the door, it's $8. So <laughs> such big savings if you pay ahead online. But the point is, I know who's coming, and people don't want to give up five bucks. It's only five bucks, but let me tell you, if they don't make it, they ask for a refund. And I'll give it to you, no problem. But just that little $5 commitment makes you more likely to have that person come. So it could be something nominal, and you have a better idea of who your audience, how large your audience is going to be. You know, you have a room set up like this, this big, and three people show up. It's crickets. It sucks for the teacher. Um, test it out. Try a program. Do a little dry run. Look at the big picture. You don't want to um, lose money for the sake of losing money, but it may cost you money to do it, and in the end, recoup your costs by having more donations come in, having a program that can start to self-sustain. So you just want to think very wisely about how to invest your money and being able to recoup it and time also. And possibly consider sponsorships. Um, there's a lot of education sponsor organizations out there in the US. I'm not sure how it is here, but feel free to go outside of the box. Like I said, a construction company or an electrical engineer, somebody who had a teacher that really made a difference in their lives or has a pet that they're really obsessed with. It doesn't have to be animal related. Look, about, look out and uh, see if you can find a sponsor for maybe just one program and you have a different sponsor for each program. I had sponsors um, allow me to come. I, they pet safe allowed me to come. They paid for my airfare. I couldn't have come without them. So I just reached out and asked. Thank you, pet safe, pet safe. I love pet safe. Choosing your topics. It doesn't matter. It's whatever the teacher is good at. So if you want a topic on dog training, but you have a teacher who just doesn't really know much about dogs, but is great with pigeons. I mean pigeons. <laughs> Parrots. <laughs> if you want to talk about pigeons, knock yourself out. But I don't know if you're going to get any attendees. <laughs> I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't. Parrots. It might not be the program you want, but it's a program. 
and it's a teacher that's knowledgeable in that topic, so go for it. Whatever is their knowledge base is what you can start out with. Um, fit within their existing scope of knowledge, and then as they expand that scope, you can start to add on additional programs as your programs become successful and you want to add on more and more. And it has to be audience appropriate and age appropriate. Um, you might not want to be talking about spay and neuter with first and second graders. Can get a little ugly sometimes and parents get mad when we say certain words that children shouldn't hear, which I think all children should know technical words, but it's just me. I don't even think it's technical. Anatomical words, I think children should know. But that's not age appropriate for the average parent. They don't want their child to know where puppies and kittens come from. So older children have certain topics, and other topics can be appropriate for young children and then adults. So you can have a variety of program options. A couple of ideas for topics. You guys are going to have different topics. It, it's, it doesn't matter if it's about the earth, if it's about a dog, if it's about a kangaroo, it's relevant to humane education. And that's just getting the public to start coming and seeing you as that resource and seeing you as the ringworm that they can spread to their friends and family. Audience, it's going to depend on your location and your format. If you're meeting at the local bar, you probably shouldn't have a third grade program. You know, if it's a college or university, maybe McDonald's play place isn't the best option. Maybe it is. College students are weird. They like that stuff. So maybe you use a space at a college or university or a local library, or maybe you have a space that you can use, or there's a meeting room that your uncle uh, has a, his conferences in and he's going to let you use it. Ask around. See what your meeting space can be, and that may help determine what your audience is going to be. Location options. If it's got space for chairs, it's appropriate for education, possibly. Format, maybe short ones. I do 20 to 30 minute lunch and learns at vet clinics, or I will do a full day workshop. It doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong. It could be a 10 minute thing. It could be an overnight program where kids come and they do an overnight at the shelter, and they sleep in sleeping bags on the floor in the kennels. It's really kind of fun for the dogs. Um, it is. If they're nice dogs, they can sleep inside the kennels with them. Um, things to think about, consider get some outside input. You may need help with curriculum development if it's something that you're not comfortable with. Um, make sure it's the appropriate length. Make sure it's fun, engaging, and effective learning style. If it's somebody who's never taught before, probably not the person to do it. Because there's ways to teach people just like there's ways to teach dogs. And oh, uh, live animal considerations. That's a, a big issue in the U.S. right now about whether we should have animals as humane education animals because it, it might be cruel to them to use them in this case. Um, like uh, pets in the classroom and, you know, having ferrets and guinea pigs and turtles living in a classroom, age appropriate, that sort of thing. It's, it's a bit controversial. If you're going to use live animals, make sure they're appropriate. Um, you have to consider allergies, kids being afraid. You don't want to bring in a 10-foot boa and find out this family, this kid's family was wiped out by boa constrictors recently, and you're going to trigger some PTSD right in the middle of your program. So know your audience. Make sure they're comfortable with it. You can use a live dog for bite prevention, or you can use a realistic stuffed dog. Maybe you don't have a dog. But you also have to consider the animal's perspective and make sure they're not stressed out, make sure they're comfortable, and not overwork them in your programs. Making sure to respect those differences. Um, you want to encourage and support whoever comes, even if they're different, even if their cultural background is completely different, even if their opinion of how pets should be cared for is different. Okay, I can respect that. I may disagree, but this is how we do it, and this is how I encourage to you to do it. So maybe this could be something you could try in the future, but it's just a suggestion. So it doesn't have to be aggressive or pushy. Just respect the audience that's coming in. Um, again, the appropriateness of the subject, you want to make sure it's age appropriate and audience appropriate. And controversial things like, um, I, I don't know, I can't think of an example. Cats are better than dogs, or dogs are better than cats. That could be controversial. You might want to be careful having that class because the cat people are going to get mad and the dog people are going to get mad. So have neutral topics that are um, appropriate for everybody that's going to be there. And basic facts are boring. 
have interesting stories, have it be fun, break it up with a little activity. Here's a little video, here's a little, I don't know, mime to do something. Something that's interesting and keeps them entertained. You're gonna need support. You gotta get everybody behind it. Um, obviously, th these sort of things, the ideas often come from the bottom up and the approval comes from the top down. So come up with a plan. Don't just say, hey, I've got this great idea. This is a plan that I've come up with. And this is the idea, but I fleshed it out a little bit. And I've thought about this and this and this. What do you think? Or maybe you, have, maybe you are the top. That would be fabulous, because the top really can make a lot of change. So have a plan if you need to present it for approval. And there's resources that are out there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to you in a little bit. Funding may be something you have to consider. Getting that space available may be something. Um, and sometimes you might need basic supplies and just grab, gather them together, like basic pet care. It's just a pillowcase. That's not the basic pet care part. That's just the carrying part. Um, with toys and a bowl and a bag of food and a leash and a tag and a brush. And you just pass it around. And each kid pulls out something and says, what do you, what do you think that has to do with pets? It's a, it's a watch. Oh, this means that pets need time. Good job. It's just a pillowcase full of stuff. All right, this is your resource. APHE is the uh, Association of Professional Humane Educators. It's the biggest and best in the US. Um, I, I don't know of any others. I'm sure there are others that are out there internationally, but they're a really, really good organization. If you want handbooks on how to do this stuff, if you want curriculum, for programs, if you want tips, if you want to take online classes, if you want to go to conferences, there's all kinds of stuff that's available. This is a really good resource to have somebody who's part of your organization consider joining so that they can get their hands on some, some good stuff. So don't just start from scratch. Don't reinvent the wheel. This stuff is being done, and it's being done successfully. So contact someone and say, hey, can I steal your ideas? And this organization is going to be down with that. So feel free to contact them. So again, thank you to these folks who helped me out with all of these presentations because I was starting to get confused about everything that I was saying. And thank you, PetSafe and DogWise. That's my contact. Thanks, guys.